Gospel of John, chapter number 13. And I'm going to be reading from verse number 12 to verse number 14. John, chapter 13. And I'm going to read from verse number 12 through to verse number 14. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Church, let us pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you for this gathering. You have brought us here to speak to us, to encourage our heart. And therefore, Lord, I ask for a hearing here and an understanding heart for your people, my brethren, this morning. I pray for an anointing and a grace upon them, not just to hear the word, but to be doers of the word. I pray for myself that, Lord, you will use me as an instrument of righteousness to communicate your word to your people in love and in the comfort of the spirit of the living God. Lord, our desire is to be like you. Our desire is to uh, follow after you. And therefore, Lord, as we see your word and as we see your example today, I pray that it's not just going to be something that will tickle our ears, but it's something that we're going to receive grace to be able to walk in as well. So that at the end of the day, we'll have this testimony that we have indeed been transformed by your word. Thank you for this. You're going to do and much more because we have asked in Jesus' name. Amen. We started a series um, a few weeks ago we we'll title it Mealtime Classes. Uh, Mealtime Classes. And uh, um, the, the, the reason behind that is we wanted to see certain profound uh, teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ that got shared during mealtime. And, and, um, and, and there is a lot of them. Uh, the book of Luke is filled with Jesus eating with people and sharing profound truth with them. Uh, week one, for instance, we shared about have me excused. We, we talked about uh, why we need to refrain from excuses. And last week, we talked about much love at mealtime. And that's talking about, you know, um, how you need to, uh, to love much uh, because you have been forgiven much. Uh, today, we're in the book of John, uh, and it's also in the context of a meal that is shared. The, the more significant thing about this is because this is actually shortly before Jesus's a crucifixion. Next week we're going to be having Easter, and Easter talks about you know the the death, uh, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And and so this is this is actually a very perfect uh, time to share uh, what transpired here. This this particular event that we're going to be seeing this morning took place in the context of sharing a meal together. You know, I, I've titled today's teaching the foot washing drama, uh, the foot washing. Uh, drama, the foot washing drama. Now, it's it's a kind of a drama, not because it's it's um, it's unfamiliar to the to the disciples. Uh, it's a drama because of the person that is going to be doing the washing of the of their feet. You know, last week I we did share about the fact that there was a meal time that Jesus attended and um, and uh, and uh, occasioned by a Pharisee. You know, a Pharisee actually called for this particular uh, you know gathering, and and Jesus was kind of accusing the man that look, since I came in, you did not you did not wash my feet, you did not uh, kiss me, you did not you know uh, you did not anoint my uh, you did not give me any any oil to anoint my body because these are these. 
if you were to have lived 2,000 years ago, this was a usual practice. Feet washing was the usual practice uh, in the Adirian time. And I did make mention of the fact that the reason why that was so, it was because it, it was a dusty environment. You know, the Palestinian uh, area was a very dusty, it was mostly de desert. So if you were to move from one place to another, bearing in mind that they wore sandals, you are likely to, to have your feet, you know, uh, uh, dirty. And so, and so feet washing was something that was common. But it was, it was a drama in this instance because it was going to be done by somebody that they did not expect to do it. And that's, that's why it's actually very important that we actually pay attention uh, to this particular uh, uh, passage. Now, unlike, um, unlike all the other Gospels, John actually spent a lot of time you know, giving us details, almost blow by blow account of what transpired at this particular point in time. Uh, this uh, appeared to have happened on a Thursday, you know, leading, you know, to the betrayer and of course the ultimate, uh, the uh, eventual crucifixion of Jesus. So, so, so what we're reading here happened, you know, just about 24, 40, 36 hours before the actual crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, the first 12 chapters of the book of John uh, first chapter 1 to chapter number 12 uh, talk about the three full years, cover the three full years of Jesus' ministry, but the next seven chapters, meaning chapter number 13 to chapter number 19, uh, talks actually about, you know, what happened within 24 to 36 hours. So there's a lot of details uh, that John, uh, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, has um, shared with us here. Now, there's something I want, to pay, uh, I want you to pay attention to. Uh, and the first thing is that this was a private moment. This was a private occasion. Uh, private in the sense that Jesus actually had this meal as, with his disciples. There were no outsiders, quote and unquote. It was just with his disciples or who you would call his family. So, th so this was a family time. It was a family meal that they were going to share together. Now, something really significant happened in chapter number 13. Uh, and just before we dive into it, John wants to set the stage. And the st setting the stage means he wants to tell us, um, it appears that the Holy Spirit in inspired John to tell us uh, about where Jesus was uh, spiritually, you know, where Jesus was positionally. And I want you to pay attention uh, because that's actually how, um, that's where John started uh, with this particular passage in chapter 13. Uh, what am I talking about? Look at what it says in verse number one, John chapter 13 and verse one. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Did you see that word in verse number one? Jesus, when Jesus knew that his hour had come. Now, and then when you get to verse number three, this is what it says. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. Stop. So, there, there, is a, there, is, um, there is an emphasis on the knowledge uh, that Jesus has here. Um, at Jesus, at this point, um, the, the Bible is letting us realize or reminding us that he has all knowledge. Uh, at this point in time, Jesus has all knowledge. And there is only one person uh, or one being that could be credited uh, with that kind of an attribute, and that's God. And that's why we call, it, uh, call him omniscient, meaning he knows all things. He knows all things. Now, Jesus knew that his hour had come, uh, and meaning that Jesus was not at, the point, at this particular point. Uh, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't going to do whatever he was, he was going to do right now uh, out of ignorance. Uh, he wasn't just shooting in the dark. Uh, he's actually doing it out of full knowledge. He understands everything in full, uh, that his hour had come. So, so he knew the time or the hour has come. And, and that's very important now because we, we as humans don't have that attribute to know about God's clock, you know, God's timing. Uh, uh, in John chapter number 2, verse 4, there was an instance in the, in, in the um, 
in the marriage at Cana of Galilee, and Jesus was going to be um, asked by his mother to attend to, they, they ran out of wine, and, and the mother asked Jesus, do something about it. And Jesus asked this to say, Jesus said to her in chapter number 2, verse 4, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, there are other instances when Jesus actually made reference, I think about five or six times, uh, that Jesus actually made reference to, the, to his time, meaning that Jesus actually has access uh, to heaven's clock, as it were. He has access to, to, to what, what heaven's clock is saying uh, regarding him on one hand and regarding the world on the other hand. Don't forget, he's on a mission, he's on an assignment. So, so John is telling us we're dealing with someone that is omniscient here who knows all things. Now, you're going to see in a short while why that is important. Not that Jesus only knows all things, because we, like I said, we cannot credit that to all of us. Um, there are many things we don't know. Some of us don't even know what we're going to hit this afternoon. We're that confused, you know? So, so we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, basically. Uh, we, we don't know what's, what's you know, <laughs> this is going to uh, interest you. It was when I got to church that I actually looked at, you know, the, the pants I was wearing, and I know you're going to look at it now, you know, and, and say, so, oh, okay, yeah, it's this pants I'm wearing. You know, I wanted to wear something, but I didn't pay particular attention to what I was wearing, but I knew that, of course, it's okay. It's not on, you know, everyone is okay with that, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but the point I'm making is we, we are very limited with our knowledge. Jesus, Jesus is not, and he was not at this point in time, unrepresent God, unrepresent man. He, he, he understand uh, the, 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 the heaven's clock, how it was working. Uh, and so he, he's, he's full of knowledge, you know. Um, uh, the devil does not have that full knowledge, by the way. Uh, let me just chip that in. Just, uh, that will probably set to the mind of some people who think that, oh, the devil knows exactly what I'm going to do and all of those. No, he doesn't. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse 8, had they known they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They, they did not know. There are things they did not know. They did not understand the hour had come for Jesus to actually be crucified. All the, all the, all the shenanigans of the Pharisees and the, and the rulers uh, and, and the people around, orchestrated by the devil, was just to snuff life out of him. They never had an idea, an inclination, that they were actually walking at the dictate of the heaven's clock. They had no clue. But Jesus knew. He knew how things. He knew the time has come. So, so he's coming from someone who has full knowledge. All right, what he's about to do is coming from someone who has full knowledge. That's not the only thing. He did not just have full knowledge of time. He also has full authority. Look, look at what the Bible says in verse number three. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, had all things into his hands. What, what, that's, what, that, what does that mean? It, it means that Jesus had full authority. Jesus had full authority, had full power. Yeah, he could do anything. Jesus is in a state now where he's able to do anything. He's able to do whatever he wants to do. Now, the reason why I'm paying, paying attention, I want you to pay attention to this, is because what he's going to do with all of these power, privileges, and attributes is going to shock you. Don't forget, this is someone that has full knowledge of, of, of heaven's clock. Now, the Bible is telling us again, via the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, as penned down by, by John, that he actually has full authority. He, 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 at this point in time, he's not going to do whatever he wants to do out of being weak. It's not from a weakness. It's from strength. He has all power. He could do anything. All right. Now, that's not all. And the Bible says still in verse number three, and that he had come from God and was going to God. So John is telling us, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus knew his route, where he came from, and of course his destination to whom he's going to. What does that mean? He's talking about identity. Jesus understood his identity. He knows where he is coming from and where he is going. Now, all of this together, Full knowledge, full power, uh, a full grasp of his own identity is going to shock you what he's going to do with all of that. Now, I say that because for many of us, when we are given a simple authority over something or we're given certain power, we know exactly what we do. You know, we know exactly what we do with the power that we've got. But what Jesus is going to do with all of this power and all of this authority is going to, is going to surprise you. Now, and, and, and here is also the message, you know, if you have access to God's clock 
and there is one thing that you are going to commit to doing, this is what you're supposed to do. That's what Jesus is going to tell us in a short while. If you, are, if you have all powers uh, and all authority, there is only one thing God will have you do and focus on right now, and Jesus is going to show us exactly what that, what that thing is. Now, if you were to uh, fully have a full grasp of your identity in Christ, there is only one thing that God will have you do right here, right now. And Jesus is going to show us exactly uh, what that is. In other words, Jesus at this point in time was not at a disadvantaged position. He was actually at a vantage position. He had the privilege of knowing the time. He has the privilege of having all powers and all authority. And he has the privilege of having a, a full grasp of his identity uh, in, in Christ. So he has total knowledge. He has total power. He has total full grasp of his own identity. Now, what Jesus is going to do, like I said, is going to shock you because it does not necessarily, it's, it's, it's not something that we will do when we are in a position of power, when we are in a position of authority, when we, have, when we are privy to certain things that takes place beyond and above this realm. What Jesus is about to do is not exactly what we will naturally gravitate towards. Uh, and, and what is that? But before I tell you, look at what the Bible says in verse number four, because it's actually what happened, but, but it gives a sense of, of what, uh, uh, what plays out when, it, when you want to do what Jesus is about to do. Okay, it says uh, in verse number four, he rose uh, from supper and laid aside his garment, took a towel and guarded himself. The thing, that is, the thing that Jesus is going to do with all of this full authority, with all of this full power, uh, is that he will rise to do something. In other words, he is a rising to an occasion, okay? And th that's not the only thing. The Bible says, and laid aside his garment. I'm still reading from verse number four. So what Jesus is going to do with all of this power, all of this authority, all of this privilege, kingdom privilege, is that he's going to lay aside certain things in order to be able to do it. Because this thing, there are other things that will be competing for your uh, attention uh, to, the, to discourage you from doing what Jesus will do next, all right? And the Bible says he laid them aside. And then the Bible says he took a towel and guarded himself. To guard yourself also means to, to prepare yourself some, for something. So this is something, uh, what Jesus is about to do is something you need to prepare yourself for, all right? Don't forget full knowledge, full authority, full grasp of his identity, and what will Jesus do? Next, and the Bible says in verse number five, and after that he poured water, into a basin and began to wipe or to wash the, the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was guarded. Now, this is a drama. All right. Um, why is it so? Now, I shared with you last week that, you know, if you, if you, config, if you, if you think about, you know, the gathering, the feast that they, they used to have um, 2,000 years ago, um, as, as what we have and setting, uh, the setting of our table today, uh, you're going to miss something because they, they, were not going to, they didn't have a tall table uh, and they didn't have chairs around the table that they would sit. So, so what they will do is that there is something they call the triclinium. All right? I, I'm going to show you a picture of that just, just to help your understanding. And then you're going to see where Jesus comes in and wash the feet of the, of the disciples. Do you, do you want to pick up, put, put that picture up, please? Uh, so, so they will have a triclinium in the middle, and then people are going, going to actually sit this way. All right? So, so it's not sitting on the chair, and the table is not so tall. So you're going to almost lie down, you know, with one, one, one hand you know, uh, to support yourself, the elbow, and then they're going to put a pillow by yourself, and then you're going to have conversation. That, that's, that's the picture. That's, that's, this is the setting, okay? And so you, you understand what it means to be washing their feet now. So it wasn't that Jesus went under the table, all right, and started, uh, whose feet is this one? It looks like Peter. No, that's not what happened, okay? So he, he just stood up from his position, and then he would start from one side, because their feet is away from the table, is able to do it easily. He doesn't have to struggle with them. Now, now, this is what Jesus is about to do. Don't forget, with all of the power, all of the authority, all of the kingdom privileges that he had, all of his full grasp of his identity, all of his ability to know exactly what heaven's clock look like, Jesus is now about to use all of that to wash feet. He's going to use all of that to wash feet. 
And so he, he started washing their feet. O- obviously, I can imagine the disciples were like, what's going on here? What, what's happening here? Uh, uh, he washed their feet, and, and then he came uh, to Peter. And of course, you know Peter will have something to say. In verse 6, this is what the Bible says. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? I'm sure many of us will say, Dad, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you've already seen him doing it. Are you? But, but, but it, that expression is an expression of shock. Are, are you washing my feet? What has come on you? Why, why will you be doing this? You know, why? And the reason for that is this. You know, in the day and time, when you will invite somebody to your house, especially the wealthy folks, they, they will have servants. So servants will be at the door. So as you're coming into their house, uh, they will get water and they will wash your feet and, and, and actually use that, their towel to, to dry it up. It, it's, it's actually um, a, a task, not just for any servant, but for, for the lowest of the servants. Uh, you know, in, uh, among servants, you know, uh, there are also levels, there are categories, you know. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are junior junior servants, you know, middle class servants and, and the top servants, you know. So the top servants won't do this kind of thing. And I'm not making that up, you know. Uh, in their different time, they actually have the head servants, you know, uh, the people that actually oversees, you know, the other, all, other servants. It's the junior one, the one that has just been recruited two, three days ago uh, because there's not much skill required, you know. And, and so that's where he's going to do his own uh, training, his own internship, if you like. And, and so, so Peter was shocked that his own master, his own Lord, is the one now doing this task. Don't forget, we now have the privilege of knowing certain things about Jesus' position at this point in time. Jesus had all the power to do anything, anything at this point in time. He, he could actually pronounce those feet and say, feet, get washed. All right? And the feet will be washed. Why? Because he has all the power. I mean, you will just see some water just dropping and then some, some, some things just wiping their feet and whatever. Uh, it could happen that way. Why didn't it happen that way? You're going to see in a short while. Now, now he has all power. He could do anything. He knows himself as his identity as the son of God, the one that is actually called equal, you know, with God the Father. And then he chose to start washing feet. And Peter said, no way. You're not going to do this. You're, you're definitely not going to do this. And this is what Jesus said. Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing to you, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Now, I'll put a pause there and ask you a question. Why did Jesus serve them in this manner? Why did Jesus serve his disciples in this manner? Three reasons. Number one, to demonstrate his love towards them. To demonstrate his love towards his disciples is to demonstrate his love. Look at what the Bible says in verse number one. Verse number one says, Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, pay attention to the next uh, 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 sentence or the next phrase. Even love his own who were in the world, he loved them to the, say that word, end. He loved them to the end. You know, he loved them to the uttermost. So he's washing their feet to demonstrate his love. Now, Jesus is saying, if you love someone, you will serve them. If you love someone, you will serve them. If you love your family, you will serve your family. If you love your children, you will love, you will serve your children. If you love your, you know, friends, you will serve them, you know, no, no, you, it's not talking about you serving them in order to look good or to feel better. It's going to amaze you that some of us actually serve people to look good. You know, you know as a father, you know, you have just you know, procured something for your child, you know, and, and you, 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 you share it and you give it to the child. And, and, um, and you want the world to see that you are a good father. Uh, and, uh, and so you call a meeting uh, to show them that you are, you are doing your job as a good father. 
Uh, when I say uh, call a meeting, you know, there are several ways you can do that. It's simple. You just take a photo and put it on Instagram, put it on Facebook, you know, put it on social media. Everyone sees what I'm doing as a father, you know. Uh, some people are looking at me and saying, oh, pastor is banning us from social media. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that the motive uh, of, of, of uh, the demonstration of love or serving is supposed to be the demonstration of love not because you want to show to other people that you are actually doing a good job, all right? And so Jesus is serving these people in this instance to demonstrate that he indeed loved them, you know? Uh, some of the way that we serve our people, some of them are not very easy. Some of them are not very cool. Some of them are not, you're not comfortable with it, but because you know it, it is your responsibility to serve your family. It is your responsibility to serve your children. It is your responsibility to serve your parents. You go all out, even when it is inconvenient, all right? You know, there are certain instances, for instance, when we are blessed with three girls, and there are certain instances when, you know, certain things happen, you know, in the home front that it's easier for me as a father to just let it go because I want to be at peace, you know? You, you know that girls are opinionated. They have so many opinions, and you just want to be at peace and just watch your soccer game, you know? But, 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 but sometimes you just say, no, 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 no. I love, I love this girl too much than to just allow this to go. You know, when I need to do something about it. It's inconvenient, right? It's, 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 it's ruffle feathers, but, but it is something you do out of love. Out of love. All right. So, so Jesus did this in order to show them that I actually truly love you. Now, the Bible says he loved them to the end. The Amplifier says to the last and the highest degree. As in, there is no further way that you can love anyone than the way Jesus loved his disciples here. And, and, and so, I'm, I'm challenging you, people of God, if you want to demonstrate your love to anyone, your family, your friends, your church, the way to do so is to serve them. Is to serve them, is to find a need in their, in their, in their life and to, and to fulfill it and to do something about it. All right, so Jesus washed their feet in order to demonstrate his love uh, uh, for them. And, and, and this, act of, uh, this act of Jesus is saying, you know, I can do anything for you. Because he's going to their feet and washing, you know, the, the most, you know, the dirtiest part of the body, as it were, the, the stinky part of the body. Yes, they were wearing sandals, you know, uh, but, but it's, the, the feet is not very pretty, you know. What still if you were wearing, you know, you know canvas and, and all of those things, you know, don't look at anyone's feet now, but just, you know, it, it's, it's thinking, it's, it's, it's not right, it's not, it's not nice. But Jesus said, I, I can do anything for you. I can do anything for you. So, so he did it to demonstrate his love. Number two, to develop their understanding. To develop, Jesus did it to develop their understanding. Look at what the Bible says in verse number six. Then he came to Simon Peter, and, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. You will know after this. Now, Jesus is washing their feet here to in, in, in order to help them grow their understanding. They are fully grown adults, but they have uh, the, 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 the mind and the understanding of infant, especially when it comes to the, the place of serving others in the kingdom. As a matter of fact, if you just suppose this particular passage with other passages, you know, uh, in other gospels, you will discover that it appears that this conversation actually took place around the time when they were having the conversation as, as to who is the greatest in the, who is the greatest amongst them all, you know, uh, and, and Jesus is using this to, to help them to develop their understanding that, you know, leadership is not what they had always taught leadership to be. Uh, prior to this time, they had always thought leadership is, you know, uh, someone who fits on the sweat of others. No. He's saying no. You, 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 uh, he's beginning to change their narrative, the, the narrative, and he's beginning to teach them differently, to help their understanding. And that's why he told Peter, you don't have a clue what I'm doing now, <laughs> uh, but, but, but you will get it later. Now, you get it later, and, uh, because at this point in time, he washes their feet with water, but, but shortly, in, in, some, in a couple of hours, he's going to be washing their sin with his blood. He's going to be washing their sin with his blood. And, and so, I, I believe that they will have, no, they, they will have uh, um, uh, joined, you know, uh, 
the, the, the two practices together, that's, oh, he washed our feet. And so when Jesus was talking about the washing of the water by the word, when he's going to talk about the washing of your sin by my blood, they will get it. Because their understanding has been open, so to speak, in this instance. Now, the Bible says, uh, and Peter, Peter said, no, 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 Jesus, you're not going to do this. You, you, you're definitely not going to wash my feet, you know. And, and this is what Jesus has to say in verse number 8. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered it, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Lord, no, 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 you're not going to do that. No, no, that, that's, that's meant to be for the lowest of servants in the house. No, 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 I won't allow you to do that. I mean, John, John could have allowed you, you know, uh, 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 maybe James allowed you, but, but it's because they're not spiritual. You know, I'm, I'm very spiritual. You, you can't do that, Lord. You, you can't do that, you know. And Jesus said, look, <laughs> if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Why did Jesus resist? All right, why did Peter resist? Uh, it, it, Peter felt it was, it was, it was, he was too low in rank to allow Jesus to do it. And, and sometimes we don't allow Jesus to do what he wants to do for us and in us uh, because we think that we're not good enough for it. You know, we're not good enough for it. Uh, for some of us, we, we think we're too deep in sin, you know, we're too deep in sin to receive forgiveness and, and receive grace from the Lord. So for some of us, we think we're too far from God. No, 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 God, don't even bother about me. There, there are other people that are closer home that you can help, that you can rescue, that you can save, but, but not me, you know. I'm saying to you, people of God, will you please allow Jesus to wash your feet and wash your sin by his blood? The reason why that is important is because some of us, because of our sin or certain habit in our life that we know is not pleasing to the Lord, rather than driving close and, you know, running close to the Lord, we are actually moving away from him. And I'm saying to you, people of God, if your feet is dirty, there is only one person that can do a good job, and that's Jesus. If you have sin in your life, there is only one person that can do a great job, and that's Jesus. You know, forget about whatever they have told you that, you know, you know visiting uh, some counselors and, or some psychologists or some doctors who are going to be able to help you with. No, no, no. All of those things are just window dressing. The real thing, the washing of your sin, the washing of your, your transgression is by the blood of the Lord Jesus. And you must be willing and able to receive it from him. You must, be, you must allow him to do what only he can do. You must allow him to do only what he can do. Uh, you know, you want, to re you want to be part of him, then you must be ready to allow him to wash you and just receive his washing, receive his grace, and receive his forgiveness. Now, now I need to say something here, people of God, before I go on. You, you know, sometimes, um, as believers, like we have seen in the scriptures now, it, it is important for us to know that, you know, serving whether in the house or other people outside of the church, is never going to be beneath you. No matter how much grace you've got, no matter how much uh, growth you have attained in the, realm, in, this, in the things of the Spirit, serving other people will never be beneath you. You know, serving other people will never be beneath you. And, and, and we need to overcome the flesh uh, because otherwise we're going to begin to have this superiority complex that makes us to think that we're bigger to, than serving people in our lives. Uh, a very true story, you know, years ago, this was when the church just started, I think we were just a couple of months or maybe a year or thereabout, uh, we were using the other, other building, uh, you know, in Avely, and uh, uh, you know the, you know, the, the drill at that time, uh, because we were using a, a community center, so uh, we need to pack down, uh, to, to set up and to pack uh, things out of, the, out of the center. Oftentimes, the place had been used overnight, you know, by all, of, all sorts of things. You know, you come into that place, it's thinking with all kinds of, you know, all kinds of stuff. And, you know, there are all kinds of things that you don't want to see. You know, uh, you know um, um, the old place is not, it's not, it's not you know, uh, smelling nice. So, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll have gone there. 
very early. Uh, and that's part of my job as a pastor, you know. <laughs> uh, as a pastor, it, my job is not just to come and preach. If, that, if that's the only thing, uh, honestly, I would be so grateful to God. But that's, that, that's not the only thing I do. You know, I, I, will, I will go very early in the morning, we'll wake up, and then we'll go there. A few people will join us, uh, you know, who are members of this uh, uh, technical team. Uh, and so we'll set things up. You know, uh, at that time, I actually developed some very good chest muscles, you know, because I could carry, you know, speakers and stuff like that, you know. Um, so, so I've lost that now. Anyway, so, so, so I, I, I will do all of that together with other people. So that this is not just me. Clean up, uh, sweep, and, and all of those things. And, and then we'll, we'll, hold this, we'll go for prayer. After prayer, we'll start the service. And, of course, I will preach. After preaching, I will pack the chairs. Sometimes the people that have come to church will help us pack chairs. And then they will leave. But we can't leave that place that way. We will clean up, you know, mop a few things and stuff. And, and, and so on one of those occasions, after I've done all of this, and people were already gone, and I just, I just noticed that the corner was not well, you know, Sweat, so so I got the broom and uh, you know I was mopping, and then there was this, there was this church member who was there, and um, and they were having conversation, they were having, they were just gisting, you know, the usual fellowship after after service, after church service, and and then I got to this place and I was cleaning, I was sweating, you know, I sweat a lot, you know, I was sweating, I was doing this cleaning, and then I'd pass this particular stage, this particular area, and and they and the person just you know and just called me. You know, hey, pastor, pointing to another, another place for me to go and clean. Oh, Jesus, I need patience here. Otherwise, somebody is going to get to the hospital. Now, I felt so bad that what's going on here? You are there. You just talking. What's wrong from you taking stuff and just, oh, pastor, can I help you with that? You know? And I felt, oh, I began to give God a thousand reasons why this job can, I cannot continue with this. And God reminded me, you know, remember, you are called to serve people. Remember, you're call, I called you to serve people. And, and you don't dictate what you will do. I tell you what to do. And this one, you will do it. And you will do it gladly. Say, oh, Lord, Lord thank you. You know, <laughs> I started laughing. <laughs> you know, that's what we've been called to do, people of God. You will never grow beyond serving. Because Jesus, we have just seen, with all power, all authority, all grace, full grasp of his identity, he could do anything. As a matter of fact, at some point he says, I have the power to lay it down and to pick it up. But he went to serve the people. And it's that serving mentality that actually took him to the cross. You know, when they came to arrest him, and Peter, you know, the usual way, took out his sword, I mean, took out, I mean, got the sword and, and slashed, you know, uh, and cut off the hair of, of someone. Jesus said, no, 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 no. <laughs> you, you think you are doing me a favor? You think I can take care of all of these guys? Look, I can call six legions. A legion is 12,000 angels. And you need to know what I, an angel can do. You know, an angel actually killed, I think, about 175,000 over, overnight. He said, I could call six legions, and they would deal with these guys. But, but, it's, it's, not, it's not time for that. I, I'm just trying to let you know that the stronger you are, the more disposed you are to serving people. The more disposed you are or you ought to be to serving people. And, and, and serving people, I'm not just talking about church. Serving people in your life, serving people outside of the church. But, but can we begin to see the demonstration of your servant mentality in the house first? So that we will know that you have started the kindergarten class. <laughs> you know, it's, the church of God is not a place where you come and just, and, just, and just get served. Maybe it's good at the initial place because you are just giving your heart to Jesus. But, but six months, one year, two years, five years down the track, you need to serve. You need to find something to serve other people. And I'm not just talking about carrying chairs and tables. Serving other people may just be the word of encouragement. You can't just finish church and rush out without taking with, oh, brother, how are you doing, by the way? Sister, how are you doing? You know, what, what, what can I do to help you? You know, you see a, 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 a single mother who is struggling, raising kids and, and juggling things. I, I, I can help you to be picking those kids from, from school. Is that okay? Will you be cool with that? You're serving someone. You're serving someone. 
So I, I want our mentality as people of God to change from being served to serving other people. Whether at the family level, whether at the workplace, whether in the church of God, you are always looking for an opportunity to serve because that's what you've been called into. So don't forget those two things. Jesus demonstrated, he did this to demonstrate his love. He did it to, demo, to develop their understanding. And finally, uh, he did it in order to display an example. Look at what the Bible says and um, jump into verse number 13 now. Verse number 13. All right, I- I'll read just for the purpose of complete- completeness. I- I'll read from verse 9. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> you know, it-, it went from one extreme to the other. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean but not all of you. I, I wish I had, I had more time to, 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 to you know, dwell more on this passage Be, because it's talking about a, an ongoing exercise of cleaning our feet, you know, so to speak. You, know, you, you only get saved once and, and you receive Jesus into your life and, and afterwards all you need to keep doing is to keep washing your feet. Why? Because you're walking in a world that is filthy. And, and so you're picking up dirt as you're going uh, uh, along the world and uh, along, along the journey, uh, and you need to receive forgiveness for all those dirts that you're picking up as you go through the journey. It is not, it is not a time to have God for salvation again because you, you, feel, you, you woke up this morning and you felt bad. It is a time to receive a cleaning of your feet um, again. I, 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 like I said, I, I'll just leave that portion and, and just move on. You know? But where I'm going is verse number 11. So for, for he knew who will betray him. Uh, therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garment, and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also how to wash one another's feet. For I have given you, and say that word, example that you should do as I have done to you. So Jesus did this as an example. And I'm glad he did this, you know. And this is beyond just attending feet washing services. You know, there are certain denominations that believe, you know, um, a part of the ordinance or or rather part part of the testament uh, uh, that Jesus has given to us, apart from baptism, you know, and and communion, you know, it's also to uh, have feet washing, you know, and so, um, you know, they arrange for feet washing services and stuff like that. You know, I'm not, I'm not here to, you know, disparage any denomination and all of those, but, but we don't believe in it. Uh, but be, because we don't see it f- as a follow-through in the book of Acts or, 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 or even in the epistles uh, or, of such being done. Yes, we see communion uh, going through, uh, even after Jesus had gone, we see, you know, baptism, but, but we don't see feet washing, you know. Uh, so, but the point I'm making is that feet washing is supposed to be a metaphor for us to serve other people. And the Bible calls it an example. You've seen my example now, you know, with all my power, with all my glory, with all of my influence, I decided to serve. I want you to do that to one another. Don't forget, he was talking to his disciples, So this was a family meeting, and he's telling them, make sure you find people within the family and serve them. And I believe it's at two levels. Number one is at the family level of the family of the church, you know, the local assembly. You serve them. And and number two, I believe he's also talking to us as humans, as human beings, that you serve other people. You find a need in the people's life and you serve them. And you let them know that you are here to serve them. Now, I must say this. One of the major difficulties, you know, that we find in the, in the local assembly, and I say this, you know, um, you know, as a pastor by the grace of God, is that there are instances when people who actually have needs refuse to reveal their needs. Uh, and so you don't even know that they have such needs. Now, it is not correct to castigate such people 100% because obviously things have happened. Uh, This might have happened to them in the past that makes them to be, they they want to be less vulnerable. But but can I ask people of God that it is important that you actually let people around you, especially God's people, get to know your needs so that they can feel it. 
so that they can, they can support you uh, through those moments, so that they can help you, you know, within that, you know, that space uh, or that phase of your life and of your experience. Uh, Jesus said, I, I've given you an example, and I want you to, to go ahead and serve and serve other people. Uh, and, and I wish uh, that many more of us in this assembly will follow Jesus' example to, 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 to serve uh, um, uh, other people. Serve the family, serve the church, serve the people in your sphere of influence, serve your people at your workplace, serve, your, serve the people that you meet on the street. Look for opportunity to serve the people. You know, I conclude with this. You know, as a child, um, many years ago, um, we were taught a story. Uh, um, it's a story in the Bible, the story of Samson. And, um, and we got to realize that Samson was a very powerful man. You know, they taught us, you know, in the kids' church, um, how powerful Jesus was, or rather, Samson was, at, 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 even at school. And I remember one of those days we were having a conversation. What would we do if we had such power? You know, kids, you know, oh, if I had such power. And we started imagining what we would do with such power, you know. Some of us are already thinking about certain teacher in our, you know, in our classes, you know. <laughs> How we're going to just, <laughs> you know, don't let me talk about it. But you know what I'm talking about. You know, if you had power like something and that teacher is just coming to, <laughs> you just hold it and just, and just slide you know, that's what we're thinking as, 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 as children. Now, uh, do you know that even as adults, many people still think in that way with regards to kingdom powers, grace, and privileges? You know, if, if you had that money, if you were able to get that position, if you were able to enter into that godly relationship, you know, if you, if you, if you had uh, that amount or that level of health, what would you do? What will you do with that thing that you desperately desire to have? Can I submit to you under the platform of God's word that if that thing is not going to enable you to serve others more, it's just a waste of resources. It's just a waste of heaven resources because the Bible talks about Jesus had all the power and all the authority and all he used that to do is to serve. And he said to us, I do it as an example to you. So next time the Lord bless you with anything, power, grace, position, influence, the first thing you need to think, think about is, who can I serve with this? Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. Every head bowed, every eye shut. I just want you to talk. We give a few minutes for everyone to talk to the Lord the way this message has, you know, has touched you and has blessed you and has challenged you and has corrected you and has influenced your thinking. But perhaps there are people here who, who don't have any relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've been to church one or two times in the past. Maybe you even attend church a lot more often, you know, a lot more frequently. But, but you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Don't forget, this meal was shared with his disciples. So there are certain things that you don't start doing until you become a disciple. And I just want to give such people an opportunity to become a disciple of Jesus today. And it doesn't take years to become. It takes a confession of faith or confession of your sin and, and receiving him into your life and into your heart. Every head bowed, every eye shut. If you don't have Jesus in your life, you know, you, are, you are not born again, simply put. And you want to do that today. Whether you are here in the building or you are watching us online, I want you to lead, I want to lead you in this, what we call the sinner's prayer. You say with me, dear Heavenly Father, I've come to you today. I recognize that I'm a sinner, but I don't want to remain in my sin. I recognize that you came and you died for my sin. You rose up the third day, yet you did all of this in order to save my soul. Therefore, Lord, I ask you to come into my life. Come into my heart, Jesus. Save my soul. I declare you as my Lord 
I confess you as my Savior. I renounce my life of sin. Henceforth, I make a decision to follow after you all the days of my life. And I ask that you help me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, we would like to uh, pray with you. Um, if you just walk up to me at the end of the service or see one of the ushers, they know exactly what to do. If you pray that prayer online, I will want to hear from you on the platform that you're watching us through. There is information about how you can actually get in contact with us. We'd like to share some materials with you to help your faith as well. God bless you. Amen, church. Church, please say with me, I am ready to serve. I am ready to serve more.